interesting, innovative stuff in the food system. So, uh, and I, this is going to be very informal, but to your right, we are starting with Jessica Applestone, uh, currently of the Applestone Meat Company, uh, and one of the founders of Fleischer's Organic and Grass Fed Meat. Uh, and then we have Don Lewis from Wild High Farm, who uh, is based in Clinton Corners and is doing really uh, interesting and uh, important stuff in terms of local grains and how that can uh, come back to the Hudson Valley. So, um, is it done? Uh, welcome. Yeah. This is the field experiences in the Hudson Valley class, and uh, we have just been mostly it's field trip class, and you go and see really interesting uh, farms and other places. Let's see, we visited Sprout Creek, uh, Cold uh, Chase Home, Creamery, uh, Hardy Roots, um, and um, you know we're interested in the whole aspect of. Uh, the uh, food system. Next Friday, we're visiting farm to table coat packers. Uh, and guys, we're getting to wear hair nets. <laughs> and no open toe shoes. I was uh, asked to tell you that, by the way. You've got to, you know, respect the uh, sanitation and hygiene. Actually, if you've been on farms, you, know that. <laughs> you wouldn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us about yourself, and maybe we can just go away and turn, uh, take some time just to introduce what you do. How do you came to this area? Um, well, about 10 years ago, um, my husband and I, we met about 12 years ago, and about 11 years ago, my husband and I were thinking about opening a restaurant. He's a former chef, and I always worked front of the house. I was a writer by profession. He was um, in computers and still working as a chef. Um, we looked at each other, and we decided that for this restaurant, we wanted to source local and sustainable products. And as we started looking more closely at what there was out there, we realized that there wasn't a lot. Now remember, this was 11 years ago. Things have really changed within that period of time. It's a very, very short time for the changes that you've seen here um, to have happened, actually. And the Hudson Valley has been enormous in instrument, like how these things have been um, instrumented throughout the country and certainly in the New York area. Um, and Don, I'm sure, will tell you a little bit more about how that works on his end. But while we looked at what we could get, it wasn't very much. A lot of the vegetables were being brought into the city. Um, there was almost no meat to speak of. And so we looked at each other and kind of said, well, what are we going to do? And realized that something that had interested us for a long time was working um, in a system and creating a system that didn't exist. And what we found for ourselves was a butcher shop. We, Josh is actually a third generation butcher, both his great grandfather and his grandfather had a butcher shop in Brooklyn. However, it was a kosher butcher shop. It was neither sustainable, sustainable in the sense of what you know as sustainable, nor was it sustainable in the sense of economic stability. Um, and he closed when Josh was about 12 or something like that, and his mother, who was the next in line, had never continued that. We approached him, he became our mentor, and his name was Ted Johnson, um, with the idea of opening this butcher shop and working with local farmers and getting locally sourced meat. My husband being a chef, he thought he knew how to cut meat, and it turns out he was wrong. He was dead wrong, as a matter of fact. Most chefs don't know what they're doing. There's no reason for them to know what they're doing. In fact, most butchers these days don't know what they're doing. There isn't a need for it. The way the food system has been regulated, the way the food system has been set up, it is a dying, butchery is a dying art. So what we did when we opened Fleischer's was we went to different old-time butchers and we learned our craft. We opened up our shop thinking that we knew what we were doing. And as I said, Josh didn't know what he was doing, and I certainly didn't know what I was doing. But the great thing was that we had a lot of mentors, and we also had a lot of availability. There are fantastic farmers in this area. We live in an incredibly rich and amazing area um, for just the kind of thing that we were doing. And we also had a customer base that was extremely interested in what we were doing. I had a background in marketing and publicity, so I was able to drive that as well, which is really helpful. And a lot of the farmers that you'll meet in this class, um, in your life, 
one of the key components that they have a really hard time with is actually driving their own business. They're so busy working on the farm, they're so busy planting, feeding, doing all of these things to bring their product to market, that when they finally bring their product to market, there's no market. Well, we didn't have that problem particularly. We had other problems, we had somewhat of that problem, but I was able to sort of bridge that gap because of my background. Um, the first few years were definitely a struggle. As I said, we were really learning to do what we were doing. Uh, we brought in people from, uh, as I said, other butcher shops. We also uh, worked with Tom Schneller, who works at the CIA, is very well known in this area. Uh, the Schneller family had a butcher shop for many, many years in Kingston, which was where we were located. And um, as we learned to do what we were doing, we started realizing that there were more people who wanted to learn from us as well. We would get, I don't know, 10 calls a week from people who wanted to learn how to butcher. And we'd laugh. We'd say, why don't you want to do this? This is crazy. It's incredibly physical. There's no money in it. And, you know, you're a Vassar student, or you're a Bard student, or you've just graduated from Columbia. What is your problem? You go be a poet. Go do whatever you're going to do, but don't become a butcher. But we'd still get these calls. And um, sure enough, after a while, we realized that there was this real driving need for people to want to involve themselves in the food system in different ways, in much more tangible ways than they've ever been involved before. So we started taking on apprentices. Um, and then that grew into we had to start charging because actually because of liability reasons and because we didn't want people who were just doing this as a lark. We started running a school, basically, for, butcher, for butchers, and that grew, and now a lot of our apprentices or students have opened their own butcher shops, and you can see that across the country. There's at least four or five students that have opened their own, and other students who, have work, who work within butcher shops um, throughout the country, and pretty much now that, you know, I'm looking back, it's been an incredible boom. Um, there are butcher shops throughout the country. I mean, these are still, you know, we're not talking enormous amounts, but I would say that in almost every state in the country, there's now a sustainable butcher shop. And this started in Kingston? Yeah, it started, started in Kingston. Kingston. Okay. Yep. So, I'm not saying we started it. Yeah, I'm right. just saying that we helped it along. There was already this movement, Michael Pollan. You guys read Michael Pollan? Okay. <laughs> Michael Pollan had just written his article about 12 years ago called Power Steer. It came out in the New York Times, and it changed certainly changed my own life. It changed my world. I had no idea how meat was treated in this country. At the time, I was a vegetarian. My husband was a vegan. and wanted nothing to do with the food system that we knew of. Um, he was a vegan for both ethical and physical reasons. I was a vegetarian because I just couldn't buy into the system that was producing the meat that, and even the dairy to a certain extent, that I was offered all the time. Um, so when Michael Pollan came out with that article, it was a radical shift in my thinking. Shortly after that came um, Fast Food Nation and other things that were starting to build towards this idea that people were starting to question how we ate and what we ate. And it was on that platform that Fleischer's was created. And if it hadn't been for that, Fleischer's would have failed miserably. But luckily, we were just sort of, sort of at the rise of it. The reason that we chose Kingston was one, economic. It was certainly cheap enough for us to do it. We could get the space. But two, we were in the perfect, we were positioned perfectly. Remember, the Hudson Valley is the breadbasket of New York. And so what we first did was we not only had customers from this area, you know, we, had, we have an incredibly um, diverse population here, both you know, from Poughkeepsie to Rhinebeck to Woodstock, Stone Ridge. All of, we were pulling from all of these different areas. Um, the demographics very uh, well educated in this area, obviously. Um, and, you know, it's a middle to high middle income, which is also very, supports us, because obviously when you talk about sustainable meat or any kind of sustainable food, it's going to be more expensive. The other reason was that we could have easy access to New York. So aside from teaching students, aside from selling retail, we were also selling wholesale. We worked with some of the best chefs in the city. One of the things that we learned very quickly was that, just like my husband didn't know how to cut, they didn't know how to cut either. And so it's great to be able to sell a chef a piece of meat, but they actually wanted it cut into steaks for them, or cut into small portions. And we weren't going to do that after a while. After a while, it was just too much work for us, and it didn't pay. So we would bring these chefs in, or my husband would go down and actually teach these chefs to cut. And so people, um, you know, basically throughout the restaurant world were also learning 
about meat and how to use it sustainably. There was also a large movement within the that that food movement um, to learn that as well. But there were, you know, we were able to reach out and start working with some really, really interesting people that way as well, and start moving our product that way. So there were these three arms that were creating Fleischer's. After a while, we stopped doing wholesale. It got to be too much. Um, and chefs were unwilling to work with whole animals, which, would be, which became what we eventually only wanted to sell them. So we always retained a few restaurants that were willing to work in that way. And what I mean by whole animals is whole lambs, half pigs, and um, steer that are cut into either fourths or eighths. And you're talking about like Really? Restaurants that need freezers with hooks and things Not like freezers that. with coolers, exactly. Coolers, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't necessarily need that. That's yeah. kind of a mythology, and in fact, sometimes hooks are very dangerous. Okay. But you do need space, exactly. You need space for meat to breathe. It's a living thing, so you can't just you know store it away in the same way that you would, say, a chocolate bar or even a tomato. Um, so a lot of restaurants, especially in the city where basements are, uh, kitchens are in basements, they have very limited um, cooler space, were really unable and unwilling to work with us in that way. But by that point, we didn't really need it. And there were other farmers who were making headway into that um, world as well. And that was what was also a great thing, was that we were starting to see farmers being able to sell to restaurants. Restaurants were becoming more accepting of this idea of buying meat from farmers, and farmers were kind of seeing that it could be done. And so that's where a lot of, you know, meat in better restaurants in New York comes from now. Um, certainly we were just part of that movement as well. So there's places like Flying Pig Farm, they're very well known for dealing with um, top restaurants in the city and they, you know, do a lot of their business that way. One of the things that I would recommend all of you doing is visiting farmers markets throughout the area and certainly the green market in New York City if you get a chance. The Union Square Market is a remarkable, remarkable institution, and it's really also helped change the way people look at their own food systems. Even before I moved up here 12 years ago, I was a weekender, as most people have been who move up here, and um, the way that I shopped in New York City was at the Union Square Market, and so for me, I thought when I moved up here that that's what it was like up here, that I would be able to find these great little farm stands and that I was going to be able to find sustainable meat. It's changing now and it has changed, but that's not what I did find 12 years ago. But Union Square, for me, was the, was the additional thing that sort of set me into motion about thinking about where my food came from and making those connections with farmers. And that's what's so important about going to farmers market is farmers markets is seeing who's producing your food. And the same thing with Fleischer's. It's who's producing your food, how it's done, what those connections are. I'm going to wrap this up. But my husband and I sold Fleischer's about six months ago. Um, it's great. <laughs> really enjoying it. Um, and it's a wonderful thing that we've been able to... Uh, our investors who had already been involved in the business basically bought out a percentage of our shares. And so, we know that it's going to remain and continues to remain basically working in the same methodology that it's always done, which is to buy either directly from farmers or buy from co-ops. Um, that's given my husband the opportunity to create a different business and one that we both feel is actually the missing link for so much of what goes on here in the Hudson Valley. And that is a USDA, and what I mean by that is that it's um, federally inspected processing facility. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about slaughterhouses and processing, but there's very few slaughterhouses. The ones that are available are usually overwhelmed. If they're not overwhelmed, they don't always do a great job. It's because they're not trained as professional cutters necessarily, or they might be trained as cutters, but they're not cut, trained as case cutters. In other words, they don't just sort of the fine art of butchery. It's very difficult for a lot of farmers who bring their animals into a slaughterhouse to come back with something that one may know what it looks like, it's produced or it's packaged in a proper way. Um, sometimes there's loss. There's always a yield test that we do with all of our animals. When, so like the carcass comes in and it's a say 750 pound carcass, you know a certain percentage of that is going to be something that's saleable. There's going to be a certain percentage that's not. 
Farmers don't always know when they go into slaughterhouses what that percentage is going to be. Sometimes there's more loss. Sometimes there's, you know, very often these animals are raised organically or really beautifully. And they're, you know, they're made into sausages, but the, so the spice mixtures for the sausages might be coming from, you know, a non-organic, using non-organic spices, or it could be mixed with, um, you know, say, milk that's not organic as a binder. And a lot of farmers don't, can't sell that if their meat's organic as an organic product, and so they lose money. So we've seen this for years, and um, in the and this is so this is one link that we've seen that, that doesn't work. And the other problem is um, there's also a need for those farmers and other people to be doing value-added products that they're not able to do. And so. Um, my husband loves making charcuterie and sausages, and that's actually where a lot of the money is in meat. So, in other words, it's great if you can buy a lamb chop or a steak, but there's a limited amount of that. But there's no limit on ground meat. There's no limit on ground lamb or ground pork, really. There's just so much of the animal that's actually ground. Um, and because of that, you can make something that's maybe we sell normally for $4.99 or $5.99, to something that's a pound is going to sell for $12.99 a pound. And so for any farmer, that's an enormous, enormous bonus, and for us as well. And so um, Josh has been able to buy all these very expensive, very exciting Italian curing cabinets and smokers and things that just, you know, you press five buttons and suddenly, you know, it basically 18 days later out come your salamis and your um, sausages and things like that. So he's thrilled. Um, we're already um, working with co-ops in the area. Um, and remember that the growing cycle here is that most farmers will be slaughtering in the fall, and so that's what our expectation is. Um, so we'll be probably starting sort of mid-summer to early fall. We may be doing home deliveries um, service. A little dodgy about that one. And where will this be? Where will be? Um, so the actual facility is in Ackworn. It's five minutes away. When we closed Fleischer's, we realized that we really didn't want to do uh, retail anymore. We didn't want to have employees. And we have tried to streamline this. So basically, we have zero to one employee. We have no You guys will be doing all this stuff. Oh, don't look at me. I'm going to go every site school. I'm not doing anything about that. I mean, I'll do the marketing and publicity, okay. but. Um, no, he's, I mean, really, these machines are incredible. These are, you know, this is exactly what he has been sort of plotting for, the, for a long time. This is what he wants, and because of the innovations in technology, he is able to basically do a lot of this with, you know, the help of a student or two. We'll always keep training people because it's just a wonderful thing, and it's how we basically have trained an army to go out into the world and make these changes. You know, we were able to put five people out that became 50 people who now are butchers and who are now working in the sustainable meat world or working with chefs. And so, yeah, it's pretty much we've... And this will be the Applestone Meat Company? And that is the Applestone Meat okay. Company, so that is what we were doing now. And, you know, we're just trying to... We're trying to take it easy. Yeah. So, the other thing that I need to say is that um, during our time of opening pleasures of having a space in Kingston. We also opened another shop in Brooklyn, which is in Park Slope. Again, I'm a marketing and publicity person, so I looked at the demographics of where it would be best to open our second shop. And knowing what I did about Park Slope, it has the, literally the highest number of um, people with secondary degrees in New York, in the New York area, which was surprising. I figured everybody would be centered around Columbia, but I guess everybody moves to Brooklyn. The everybody has 2.3 children in Park Slope, and you can see it on the streets. It's ridiculous. You can barely walk through the strollers, and the money's there. So we opened a shop in Brooklyn, and of course, it's done incredibly well. Um, and what we wanted to do, and what we did do, was also open a processing facility in Redford, Brooklyn, so that that processing facility now takes all of the meat, processes it there, and then distributes it to the two stores, both Kingston and Brooklyn. So that's like an annex for, for it the is. butchering? And, and, exactly. It's the training center. It's an annex for butchering. And it's also where all of our um, value-added products and our processed food is, is, is done. Um, and it also allows uh, Fleischer's to grow as a chain. Um, in other words, like, we would never, we, our goal was when we owned Fleischer's, to open up um, on the Upper West Side and maybe other places in Brooklyn. But 
Store spaces in Brooklyn are so small that you can never do the things that you want to do out of them. So by having sort of a more centralized location, it gives the company that ability to grow in that way. So. John, tell us about Wild High Farm. Um, well, history. And, and yourself, yes. Myself. Um, yeah. um, I grew up here in the valley. Um, my parents were chicken farmers over in Middletown. And um, when I was, uh, I guess, in my late teens, I became a commercial beekeeper. And that was my, that was my business. I did a stint, uh, I did a two-year stint in, in the Middle East uh, on kibbutz farming, um, which are communes, those are not familiar with kibbutz. And I spent a year raising fish and a year commercial beekeeping. I loved both of those things. And when I came back, I decided to uh, go into beekeeping. I had done that for throughout the late 70s and into the 80s. And um, during the course of that, I built a small bakery in my house and started a baking career. I was in the early 80s. And I did all of my sales were um, at Union Square. I spent, I spent 30 years uh, selling at Union Square. And um, that's a great experience. Uh, that's a, a great experience in a lot of ways. And so um, from that zone, I was able to really connect with consumers and learn what drove them, what they wanted, and, and then really how they wanted it. And, and the whole development of the food system, the local food system, was really unfolding in front of me uh, during the course of that time. And I was um, uh, kind of progressive in my bakery. There was a lot of competition in bakeries at the time. And it was the onslaught of the, um, the rustic loaves, the European style loaves that we're all so used to uh, purchasing now. Uh, Dan Leader came on the scene in the early 80s and started this whole Bread alone. Uh, bread alone, wood fired uh, hearth oven he brought over from France. It was quite a remarkable um, thing that he did. And it just changed the way people thought about bread and all this. And so there I was selling baked goods and breads, and I was not making these breads that style. So I had to focus on home style like my grandmother would make. And um, I did that, uh, well, continuously. But um, after some time, I came in contact with a, a grower out here near Millbrook who was um, growing organic grains for animal consumption, making animal feed. And uh, I raised chickens, uh, amongst other things, too. But um, So I was raising chickens back then. When I heard about it, I went up there and uh, to get some organic feed. And he had his first... Uh, crop of wheat that he had grown, like 5,000 pounds of wheat, and he grew on a dare. Uh, he had been talking with, uh, he was not from around here, he was actually from uh, Saskatchewan, Canada, and, uh, and he uh, wanted to grow wheat for human consumption, um, having um, been in the Peace Corps in Africa and all, had this real connection to feeding people. And so uh, the local farmer said, we can't grow wheat here. And uh, he goes, in that following season, he started growing wheat, um, basically on a dare. Knowing the history of the Hudson Valley, uh, the farmers here have said, we can't grow wheat here. This is the Hudson Valley. But meanwhile, if you go back 150 years, the valley was full of grains, small cereal grains uh, for human consumption. And, uh, and for hundreds of years, this was the breadbasket of the United States. And so, uh, knowing that, he dove in, and that's what happened to be when I met him. And he was, had a little mill, and he was milling flour, his wife was making cookies, and the rest of the wheat was going into, into the chicken feed. And so, uh, he gave me a big bag of flour, and he said, well, you're a baker. Here, check it out. And I stuck my hand in that flour, and, and I realized that this is very different. And I took it home, and um, I was able to incorporate it into my production. And uh, I started baking a 
across the board in almost all my products I started including the, that flower in there and he kept milling. And how is this really different? What, what do you mean? Well, this is a stone mill process and so stone milling uh, compared to the uh, commercial flower that, that is all around us and what we've all been raised on uh, is a roller mill process. And the Industrial Revolution really changed the food system because of mechanization. These new, these new machines were able to uh, process uh, grains into flour uh, extremely fast, extremely fast. And, um, and during that, the process is different. Uh, stone milling, the grains go in and they are pulverized. The whole thing is pulverized. In the roller milling process, it goes in and it's polished. The grains are polished down. And so they, they polish off the bran. Then there's the endosperm, which is the, the, um, the carbohydrate, uh, the white flour. It also houses the gluten in, in that part, and that's the uh, protein content. And then there's the heart of the wheat, which is the wheat germ, and that's your amino acids and um, vitamins are contained right in the, in the wheat germ. And the brand was, the, was your minerals, so there's the complete food, minerals, carbohydrate, protein, and then vitamins, amino acids, uh, as a whole brand, it's complete food. And so that, that process polishes it down and they separate all of that and then they put it back together again. And they, the flour is enriched because they add chemical uh, vitamins to enrich it, build strong bodies to our place. And then um, they sell the very valuable wheat germ for that marketing. And um, they will add the bran back to the white flour to create what they call whole wheat flour and then sell that on the market. And by removing that germ um, really helps to extend the life of the, of the flour in, in the marketplace. Because really when you break grain and whether it's cracked or becomes flour, it only lives for about three months, two to three months, and then it's dead. And um, so this enabled them to have a longer shelf life, avoid rancidity of the of the oils that were in the wheat chunk. But unfortunately, it doesn't avoid the, the rancidity of the protein, the gluten. And that's one of the reasons why so many people struggle with gluten intolerance, is because our bodies are starting to reject the, um, the rancidity in the protein itself that's inside the flour. So things like celiac, that's not just a natural response to it. Celiac is a disease. Celiac is a disease. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and gluten intolerance, gluten intolerance. Is, is, a, is a condition. But it's a, and it's responding to not the natural state of it's an weed, an, but it's, it's an specific. Yes, exactly. It's an inflammatory response. Which is why everybody goes to oil and can eat pasta and yeah. they're um, not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. And in France, Italy, yeah. you can you can go and, and eat the bread and eat this and say, you know, I can't eat it in the United States, but I can eat it here. And, and it's basically because their system, they are so much closer to the mills, even if they are using a uh, roller mill process, that the, the commodity flour, it, there's a, a shorter amount of time from, from milling to consumer. Whereas here, it takes more than two months for commodity flour to get to the busiest bakery making the most beautiful breads. And uh, then on top of it, um, the retail part of it, the packages, they have a year date on them. So at least a year's date of expiration date in the stores. So this is this is so one of the very big differences, is, and I mean, the reason why I thought it's so important to return to stone milling is to offer, and what really what drives me, which is food politics, but this part of food politics is a, is accessibility in the food system, and um, and at that point it was a it was a tipping point for me. It, it all started to register. I had frustration up until that point, um, raising a young family and um, loving to eat. I grew up, you know, eating, even though we didn't have a lot of resources financially, we ate very well. And we had a tremendous focus on the quality of foods that we grew in the garden. My grandmother put food by. Um, everything was very simple. 
we love to eat, and it was always a ritual in our house. And, um, you just used a really old-fashioned expression. That we're not going to know. Put food by. Oh. <laughs> Put food by. Do you understand that? Put food yeah, by. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. I knew it. He needs jarring and jarring and um, jamming. That's what you do. Yeah. Put food by. It's, you put food by. It's <laughs> a pass me by. Uh, sauerkraut, jams, uh, even frozen food. My grandma would fill the freezer. She would spend the summer, she lived in, in Queens, she would spend the summer with us. When she left, there was three giant freezers that were full of produce that she had transformed one way or the other into pot pies, ready to bake, um, uh, all kinds of things. There were sauerkrauts and, and uh, crocs and big crocs. Uh, it was just what, what you did. And you didn't just go to the store to buy sauerkraut in the bag. You made the sauerkraut, it's alive. Pickles, all of that, jammed. So, um, so the tipping point. The tipping it? point, okay. yes. Uh, raising, raising a young family, I started to realize that, that I, where, I can't find anything. I can't even go to the diner and get a piece of egg. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And it was very frustrating for me. And it went on, frustration went on for a while, but when I met and I met this farmer, and, and, and I was baking, and I started working with this flour. It, at first I said, oh, well, I have something unique here. It'll help me compete with my competitors in the marketplace, just having this unique flour. And that was my first approach. But only a short while after, it struck me, and I realized that this is the way it was. And this is really important, because the nu nutrient density of the flour the flavor uh, were very important factors that we should have access to be eating. And in this country, this great country, when you lose access to something like choice of the type of food that you can that you can reach, uh, there's a problem. And I started to really understand how big the problem was at that time, and that made me go, "Well, the farmer liked to grow this." I like to use it, so I started to lean on him and say, okay, next year or this fall, we have to plant more acreage. We need more acreage, more growing more acreage of wheat. And if you grow it, I'll buy it. And so I made a commitment to him. And that is the formula for everything that I do nowadays. And we don't have a lot of time here. I could talk for hours on this, but from that point to where I was a few years later, I was running, I went from 5,000 pounds of, of, of grain, which is not 5,000 pounds of flour, because I suddenly learned that 100 pounds of grain only gives you 70 pounds of flour. And so, understanding that, within a few years, I was supplementing my bakery with this flour, and I had it in all of my products. And at that time, there wasn't a consumer base that was focused on this concept. And so I really couldn't tell the consumers what was happening, where I was selling. They had bad experience with organic baking. There's somebody in the marketplace who produced organic baked goods at the time and was a really poor baker. So they tasted organic muffins and they they, would, they vowed they would never eat it again because they're thinking that this is organic. And that, so I couldn't say that. And it took quite a few years until my, my percentages, every year, it started off with 8% of my ingredients were local flour, our flour, and then 12% the next year, 15% kept getting bigger, the more acreage. And um, so once I got up there a ways, then I said, okay, now I'm going to start informing my consumers. So I started posting a sign and putting ingredients. This is before ingredient labels were law, New York State law. It's putting ingredients on my products and highlighting the local flower uh, in green with an asterisk and explaining it underneath. And then I put up a sign, our local ingredients and their producers. And I put this up at the table. And this is before, now this is regulations in the marketplace now. And uh, this is, this 
exceeded the regulations. So this was a tipping point for me. Uh, it, it evolved tremendously, and within a few years, I was milling, I was running my bakery 100% on our flour. Um, it was um, I had taken over the milling process because the farmer needed to be farming. So I had a little bit bigger equipment I started working with, and um, and I was running at around 25, 20 to 25 tons of grain annually, just eight years later. And so that was my status quo for quite a while, and then um, I had enough security in my mind that this local grain-based food system that we had resurrected had enough. Um, supplies to allow me to start selling flour to consumers. And so I started offering it retail first the packages, and then, um, and then I went to re uh, wholesale packaging for stores, and then the following year more acreage, so then I went to 25 pound bags the same way. And that was a tipping point once again for the, the level of this whole local grain based food system. A few years ago, four years ago, I, my status quo was about 50 tons of grain, local grains, and it being processed annually. I met, this, um, I met these folks uh, uh, from Italy that were building a store in New York City uh, called Italy, New York. It's on Fifth Avenue with 23rd Street. Italy. Mm -hmm. Do you know who that is? Yeah. Yeah. It's, Vitaly Bastianic, uh, Lydia Bastianic, Joe Bastianic, and uh, uh, Fernelli from, from Italy created this store in Torino, Italy, which was a local food store there and um, highlights the best of Italian regions and with a focus on everything local and the best quality. They wanted to bring that here and they have a bakery there and they resourced the flour from a local miller, stone milled product once again. They wanted to replicate that here. And when they came, um, they were look, they, they were trying to do resourcing and they looked for flour. And they went all around the Northeast and they couldn't find flour that was suitable to replicate the breads that they were making in Torino. And then one of the one of the partners remembered meeting this very outspoken crazy guy from New York uh, in Italy at the World Food Conference, uh, Terra Madre. And said, there's this guy that I met, and we have to find him because he may have what we're looking for. And then they searched me out. And um, after many emails and a couple of phone calls, I started to talk to them because I just thought it was another bunch of crazy people that were going to build the best Italian store in New York City. Like, that's been done several times already. And I was busy, and I you know, okay. Finally, I understood. They said, oh, we're very serious. And I understood who they were, and I just also understood how serious they were. And so we started our relationship. I invited them up. We talked about what we believe in. I talked about what I believe in and what's really important to me and building this system. And they talked about what's important to them. And I realized at that point that we were, we had a very symbiotic relationship developing and that these folks would enable me to continue my efforts to build a larger local grain-based food system and turn it into a regional grain-based food system. The Northeast, which will help feed the Northeast when we need to be fed, quality food. So this was very exciting for me. I took them on. My production doubled at that time. I had moved into a new facility, new equipment, bigger equipment and my production doubled. I'm now milling 80 tons of grain annually. We've been doing that for uh, a few years now. And uh, that represents about 70 to 90 acres of wheat that wasn't being grown in this region before. That is the thing that really gets me going. It's really, this is the most exciting thing for me. Um, last fall, the fall planting of wheat in October, I um, organized uh, seven or eight new farmers that are growing 300 acres of hardened wheat for their orders. This is to feed their, their demand. So this is, 
And this is going to be starting to mill this in this September. And so uh, it's a tremendous increase of acreage, uh, very exciting. And then um, two weeks ago, I just made commitments for this fall planting of 600 acres. They, um, they're serious, and, and I'm just, just diving in and doing what I love to do, and that's to build these relationships with farmers, to, to plant this week, pay them a, a, a reasonable price. This is another thing, is that this whole grain system that we're working with right now is removed from commodity structure. We do not follow the commodity pricing that's issued every day in Chicago. Um, yeah, I cannot call a farmer out west and say, send me 20 tons of wheat from his farm. I have to go to a middleman and, and buy it from, a, from, from them, and they control the price. It doesn't go to the farmer. Um, and so this whole process here is I, I pay a, a more fair price to the farmers and it's more of a flat line. And they get a little skittish because sometimes commodities jump, so like it did last year, the corn prices were going crazy. They wanted to sell their corn and commodities because they can get more, they can get more selling animal feed than they can for human consumption. It was really sick. Some of them did jump, but the thing about relationships is that they know that I'm going to be here, I'm serious, my customers are serious, and this is what's really very important to this whole system. And it's working. And so, we, as I said, we just bumped up to 600 acres. Um, they just opened a, a new store in Chicago. It's bigger than the one in New York. You have to go online and look at them at, at Italy. Uh, you have to see what they do. And it, um, so I didn't expect to be supplying Chicago. I expected them to resource locally because that's kind of what they want to do. And then at last minute, before they opened, they said, oh, by the way, we need you to supply Chicago. So that's a whole new dynamic. And they're willing to sacrifice their, their, um, their wants to have local ingredient to at least get the quality that they want to, support, to, to use for their products. And so, um, so that's why they're still taking flour wheat from here and using it there. And they consider that, they're not considering that local. But it, it's the most important thing that they replicate that bread, that like the bread in Torino, and so I'm able to do that for them. Um, I've also replicated um, a, a flour, a blended flour that they use for their focaccia. So they make a tremendous amount of focaccia, and um, it replicates a, a heritage variety that's grown in northern Italy. And I've done that by blending uh, hard wheats and soft wheats together in certain manners according to their characteristics taste, um, all of their characteristics, baking characteristics, has to be very specific. And I fortunately have this knowledge, having uh, been a commercial baker for 30 years, and a miller, uh, and milling and baking, learning to mill, I should say, and then learning to use that flour and make it work. Uh, so I understand the chemistry of it all, and it enables me to do that. Um, so this is what I've done for them, and now my next phase is uh, I'm going to Chicago in a couple of weeks and I have some colleagues out there and I'm going to start resourcing growers within 200 miles of Chicago which actually hits five states kind of quite remarkably and um, I'm going to attempt to rebuild this system that I have here out there to supply them with their grains from that region in the same manner, totally the same manner. And for Chicago, now that's the, you know, the commercial nexus for traditional big agriculture. You bet. Chicago, you know, the commodity, commodity cars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. So you're really like bringing the Trojan horse into the uh, you got it. into enemy gates. And you got it. I, I'm not, a, you know, the world needs brick throwers once in a while, but I'm not, I have bad wrists, I can't throw bricks. But one of the reasons why I've done what I've done um, is to create a model attempt to create a model. And I, when I did it, I, I thought to myself, well, if it works and I can get away with this, then it, it could be replicated. If I can do it here, then other people can do it elsewhere. And that was what really was driving me politically. And, and that's what has happened. And I lecture about this throughout the Northeast. 
And uh, if I turn around and look behind me, I can see from here to the Canadian border, there's 10 or 12 groups of people that are replicating models similar to this throughout the Northeast. And now that, what was a, a, a local home-based food system that we did here, reconstructed here, now the, the map is spotted with these throughout the Northeast. That's the foundation. I look at that as a foundation of a regional grain-based food system that will feed the region uh, with local grains that are, you know, have great uh, nutrient density and and uh, the economy, the local, you know, help build the local economies and the food system. So, a question: If we were to go out and do wildlife farm and clean corners, mm -hmm. we would find a bakery, uh, not necessarily a retail bakery. You got the facility, we find a milling uh, facility. You don't grow your own wheat, right? You're I getting that from? I get it grown. Okay. I do grow test plots. Okay. okay. They're always growing. Like when I was in Italy, I came back with, with like eight varieties, little handfuls of, of interesting wheat. I grow them out. And I, I do it every year. And if they look good, then, then we try to get it to the point where we can put it into mechanical planting. And, and like right now, there's heritage varieties that were, for the last three years, there's a heritage, hard red winter wheat that five years ago was not here. Okay, so now this is interesting because in this class so far, we've started by looking at farms and operations that are doing very direct to consumer kinds of uh, agriculture, whether it's, you know, the dairy farm that's got the cheese processing so that goes to Union Square, or the CSA, and they're selling produce. Now, what's interesting about you two, it seems to me, is that your main ingredient, you're not producing. You are further up now in the value chain. And so, you know, on the one hand, you've been talking about how you're educating consumers at the end of the value chain who want to buy this product, but you're also organizing a set of relationships beneath. And so, can I ask you something about that? Like, you know, tell me about these, for lack of better words, networks or communities, of, in your case, you know, animal growers, in your case, farms. Where's the, um, you know, where's the uh, direction of influence coming from? It sounds like you guys are really key in, you know, educating these growers that this is what they should be doing. Yeah, it is. Um, sorry. Um, for us, it's, it's very different. I mean, and here's here's the difference between um, what we do and, and what you do to a certain degree. There's a lot of differences, but one is cost. Um, you know, basically, we're dealing with live animals. They cost a lot of money. Um, one of the how much is a like what a, a steer, a cow? Uh, how much does that cost? Steer. Cows steer. are dairy yeah. um, in general, or unless you're talking about like large groups of animals, but what we deal with are steers. Does anyone know what a steer is? A male cow. I don't count. <laughs> you don't count. You count. Go ahead, nobody else knows. <laughs> uh, it's castrated um, at an early age. Got it. It's a male cow. That's oh, a male, male, cow, that's a male animal. Grown out for me. Correct. Oh, right. Yeah, a male cow that's castrated at an early age. Um, How much does that cost? Well, depends if you're talking about commodity markets or you're talking about what we do. So um, let's give a general of like wholesale twelve hundred dollars, nine to twelve hundred dollars, um, and what that can become, you know, is incredibly it's exponentially increased by what you're doing with it. Um, if you age it, if you age meat that adds value to it. If you you know, if you're selling from a retail butcher shop on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, that's certainly going to add value to it. If you have these value-added products like sausages and charcuterie, that adds value to it. So it's sort of, you know, you can always take that and really grow that, certainly also in a different way than a farmer might. Um, can I just talk about one thing that's sure. off topic? But I just want to go back to what you said. So if a steer is a male cow, that's castrated, and a female cow is a dairy animal. What happens to the male cows that are born on dairy farms? Aren't they just ground up and used for feed? 
Really? No. That's what goats are, right? That's what we learned about from the old animal goats. They just well, there's no animals that are ground up and used for feed anymore because that's against federal regulations. It may that's still true. yeah, exactly, because of mad cow. Um, there are other things that they do do, and you're right, that would have been done 15 years ago. Um, but not anymore, unfortunately, uh, fortunately for us. <laughs> unfortunately, there are ways of getting around those regulations so that they can still use blood, and there's other things. We can get into that if you guys are interested. But um, So, male cows, dairy farm. Because you guys went to a dairy farm, and yes. I really want to know what you guys think happens to these. Because you remember, it's a 50-50 chance. Come on, guys, this is economics. I mean, like some percentage of them must be used for uh, for the breeding of cows. Yeah, a small percentage, but remember, the just studs. need one. Yeah, right. <laughs> and right. a, lot, a lot of the breeding is done uh, uh, hey. uh, with, yeah. with artificial hey, right, right? Yeah. So it's like yeah. much so more. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a, it's a lot more advantageous for a farmer to to buy semen uh, from a specific bull that has specific characteristics and family tree than it is to raise their own bulls. Also, it's, it's honestly, it's a pain in the ass to raise a bull. I mean, yeah. who wants a bull around? They're, they're really, you, you really don't want a bull around. And the amount of times that you use them. Right, and it's so much easier to just, when the cows in, you know, in heat or in estrus, and you just artificially inseminate, it's so much easier. So, okay, so now you've got maybe the one bull or you've got artificial insemination. This is the economics of farming right here. This is the economics of my business. Slaughterhouse. Can you still eat them even if they're not castrated? Veal? Veal. Slaughterhouse. However, you can't slaughter them right away. Yeah. You've got to raise them. So what do we have around here all the time, you guys? We pass, you pass them all the time. You pass them on dairy farms. Vermont is filled with this. Come on. Dairy farms that have veal huts. Have you seen them? You must have Little seen angles, them. You didn't see when you no. went to the you didn't see them. Back. There's not any at Sprout Creek. No, There's, that's Sprout. No, yeah, yeah. but go to Ronnie Brook and they have a few. Yeah, most dairy farms you see. Yeah, them. like the veal huts. Okay. Veal huts. And they're just selling there locally. They're, they're local mail. Well, dairy doesn't pay. Yeah. I mean, if anyone will tell you, dairy is probably the least economically viable thing to do at this point, which is why places has been for decades. For decades, which is why places like Sprout Creek exist. Because again, you have to do a value added product to make your milk worth it. There are certain things in our food system that people value and there are certain things that they don't. And it's not a value of whether it tastes good or whether they think it's important nutritionally. It's about how much they think they should pay for. So good wheat, he's always going to have a struggle. People want to buy inexpensive wheat because bread's inexpensive on the marketplace. But a ribeye, I can get a lot of money for a ribeye. However, ground meat, not so much. And chicken, forget about it. It doesn't matter if my chicken is literally running around my backyard eating worms and all the things that it should be. Nobody is going to pay a lot of money for that chicken. It's not as much as they're going to pay for the beef. But honestly, it's a lot easier to raise a beef than a thousand chickens and get your money back. So again, the thing that dairy farmers are making money on is that 50-50 chance of that male cow that's going to be raised. Now, do any of you eat veal? You do? No? Why don't you eat veal? Oh, I mean, that's not okay. Don't eat veal, but I just don't generally. I mean, I've had it to see that veal before. It's just like a... I never did because it was ethically it was squeamish to me. Ethically it was squeamish, but why? Because it seems like you're... <laughs> You're taking a, a young thing that has is still trying to this one. Okay, so <laughs> now how, I know this. So how old are goats, lambs, chickens? Goats are goats, goats are five months old when they make meat goats are five months old. And how about a pig? Pigs are nine to six, six to nine. Six to nine, yeah. Yeah. Six to nine months when they're full grown. You're saying what about chickens? The, the chicken industry, the chicken that you eat when you go just about anywhere, those chickens are eight weeks old. Mm -hmm. from, so, from zero to eight weeks, and there's a chicken in a bag. Lamb is six months. So when you talk yeah, about... Yeah, don't eat sheep. They eat lamb. Right. Well, which is, do, is, is do, like veal. They do eat mutton. Mutton, yeah. yeah okay, yeah, but, yeah. That, but generally speaking, you're right. At Fleischer's, we sold much older sheep. Um, because we liked the taste of it, and we wanted a larger animal. And it was more benefit, cost effective for us. And people actually had no idea that they were eating older animals. They just really liked the taste. And we did. Mutton has a bad rap. 
That's another story. It does have bad eyes, that is another story. But anyway, what I'm saying to you is the economics and the marketing of meat is really interesting. In other words, you haven't eaten veal your whole life because it got a bad rap. And I'm not saying that veal are raised well, but the idea of not eating veal because it's a baby, or not eating lamb because it's a baby, your chickens are two months old. You're eating a baby. Your goats are five months old. You know, it's this idea of call what... Kids. I'm sorry? They call them kids. <laughs> exactly, they call them kids for a reason, exactly. So there's an idea of what the economics of the meat industry are versus the reality of the meat industry. And so, um, you know, that's, there are a lot of things that we had to learn about what the actual economics were of all of this. It's two years, two years, right? A grass, a born, a born on grass, 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 grass is two. It's two years. That's a yeah. long, a lot of farmers don't want to go two years because commodities, they'll take them at, at what, 16 months or 18 months? Yes. 12. 12 months. Yeah. yeah because they, they, give, they give them grains, put fat on them, and they push them through. And Our, they yeah. want that turnover. They don't want to take them through another winter and feed them haylage. haylage. Um, they, want to, they want to move them on. And so the, the grass, born and finished on grass, two years. That's a long investment for a farmer to go through. So then there's, there's, there's my Yeah, so, sorry. That's no, okay. No question. Um, is, so I think the reason a lot of people don't eat organic, like wheat or meat, is just because it's like really expensive for just like a standard American. And I was wondering, is there any way like with more supply that it would become less expensive and more available to like lower middle class people and more like the city of like the gifts here, just like average everyday people who don't have money to like eat organically and like, because it doesn't last like a long time either. It's like if you buy things that are cheaper and full of like bad stuff that lasts longer than something that's organic and like goes bad in a few days. Like, Let me answer that in two ways. Yeah. Yes. But. Yeah. So um, I think that you're always going to have to consider that we're talking about a cost of living and that the way that we treat farmers, the way that you treat farmers, the way that farmers should be treated and producers um, is always going to be more expensive and that's what we should be paying for. The thing is the way that we eat food in this country and the way that we produce food in this country is an abomination and should not continue. So when I look at, um, is it available to people who are lower middle class or lower, you know, who have very little money? It's available. It's there. You can even use food stamps at a green market at this point. Um, should we be eating steaks that are falling off the sides of our plate? No. Should we be eating meat every day? Absolutely not. Should we be eating bread that's produced so cheaply that we can buy it for 99 cents a loaf? No. We waste an incredible amount of food in this country. And when you eat better, and when you take all of that into account, you don't need the amount of food that people buy, nor do you need the types of food that people buy. Um, you know, one of my things for many, many, many years with Fleischer's was, how many meals can you get for $50 for a family of four? Because I figured $50 a week, or $50 every 10 days, was a pretty reasonable standard for buying meat. And I came up with 10 meals. But that doesn't mean that you're going to have meat that's, you know, these big pieces of meat in every meal. It might mean that you make a roast chicken one night and you make chicken soup the next with that carcass. It might mean that you take two sausages and you throw it in a huge pot of beans and you eat that for two days. You know, there's a lot of ways to look at this. I think we are an exceedingly privileged country. And our privilege has driven us into destruction. And so when, he ta when Don talks about putting food up and you guys don't know what he means, that to me is a tragedy. Not because you don't know what it means, but because it's not part of the culture anymore. Even I, literally, and I didn't have a garden until this year, I'm really excited for the first time because I never had the time before. We've always had chickens um, and we do have fruit trees. But even I literally go to the grain market or to a farm stand and I buy you know, a ta grow, grow a tomatoes. Every year I buy cases of them and I blanch them and throw them in my freezer and by about this time, every year I've run out and I have to start supplementing. But it may make it through the winter, you know, and I make sauce all the time, I do whatever. And that's a really important thing for me because it kind of brings, and that's cheap as hell. Um, you know, but I have that in my freezer. I don't bake. So he, you know, so Don is really of no use to me, so I think it's delicious polenta. Um, 
But if I did, I would do that and I would honor his bread more. Like I wouldn't just, you know, it, it's, it's also like the respect that you give food too. When people pay more, they also value it more. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Coming pretty well, right? Uh, other questions? I have lots of questions. Oh, Don, I have a question for you. Um, what is like what what is different about um, sort of ancient and heritage grains versus um, I guess sort of modern wheat? Modern, yeah. Um, and yeah, what are the differences, and what is like the value value of having a variety of species of grain? Oh, that's a good question. And this also ties to your, uh, one of the things that you said, and that was about, and I want to remind you about the nutrient density in this flour, in the stone milk, and the bread that it produces and the bakers that it produces, how much more beneficial they are. So when you pay a little bit more for a loaf of bread, you're getting much more because there's, there's more in it. It's, it's, it. You can live on bread alone. Quite, not the coin phrase, to use the coin phrase, uh, if it's made with good flour. And your question is really an important one. The, um, the heritage, the modern wheats have been bred um, mostly for um, commercial growing, which is chemical growing. Um, conventional growing is they, they spray herbicides to kill the weeds. Then they plant the wheat. There's no competition. And so then, so they make their wheat shorter. So they, they grow shorter, and they're breeding these wheats for production. They are, most of you probably have seen a picture of the combines out in the Midwest, and they're lined up in tandem like this, holes like four or five of them, one over here, another one over here, and they're kind of like this thing going across the field. Well, those are guided by GPS. They're guided. They cross, they have a laser, Guiding the one behind it is guided by a laser. They cross over one inch in cut. And so they plant to these GPS guidance and they harvest the same way. And so it's all about production. They breed for production, the amount of tonnage per acre. There's no breeding that's being done conventionally <coughs> for the taste and for the nutrient density. Now, in the past, the village, and it's still going on in some villages, so if you go to the Eastern Bloc countries, in the Middle East, wherever, um, in the village. So everybody, they grow different things in the village. Some people grow this, some people grow that, it's like this, and they kind of, they're self-sufficient. They kind of, the village feeds each other. You know, one person has this, the other, it's kind of, a, so there's a wheat grower there. So every year, the um, elder, usually grandmother, goes out into the field before harvest and takes the young ones with her, not the babies, but the younger farmers with her, and picks the seed that they're going to save for the following season and replant. She's selectively collecting the seeds from the field. Because you have acres of wheat and you walk out in it, every plant is not the same when it's grown naturally. They have different characteristics. Same variety, but different characteristics. They choose. Selective breeding, selective planting has been going on for thousands of years. So that's how they breed. Modern meat, there's no flavor being bred into it, and there's no nutrient density. It's all about the volume. So right away, there's a tremendous difference there. They use chemicals to control the weeds. Um, they get rid of the competition. And the heritage varieties grow very tall. Modern varieties grow very short. So the heads are all like they're easy to harvest and all. And so if you look at those Courier and Ives paintings with the people in the wheat fields at harvest, you'll notice that the wheat is taller than the people. And the people are all short. The wheat's really tall. And so that produces a lot of straw, which is used in farming. And, um, but most importantly, the nutrients. And so this is a one of the tremendous differences. The taller wheats compete with the weeds. They get above the weeds. They crowd them out. They take they make it dark down there so the weeds can't grow. So there's a big difference that way, but it all comes down to nutrient density and, and then flavor, which is it's terroir. There's 
wheat has flavor. Flour has flavor when it's made from stone milled from, from grains. Um, because wheat actually has flavor. And when you open a bag of commercial flour, there's nothing there. Now, if we would get, like, like I have a bread machine at home, if I would get your flour, would it work in that kind of stuff? I have got customers yeah. that use bread machines. I've never produced bread in a bread machine myself. But I'm just wondering, like, the weight, the density. I would, I would think that you'd have to uh, take notes. You should use it when you bake anyway. Take notes when you're converting from commercial flour to, um, to, um, um, this is why I don't think because it's chemistry. I can't stand it. <laughs> it is chemistry, and and uh, and so you should take notes to do conversion. I mean, I I I give tech advice to bakeries. I lecture on converting commercial bakeries from commodity ingredients to freshly stolen product. And one of the things is that you have to. It, it can be done. The flour is different. It hydrates different. You're, you have a recipe that works with commercial flour and it uses X amount of water and Y amount of soil. You, you, you can't just replace it. You have to you have to look and see because it hydrates different. So you have to take notes. Oh, it needs more water, or it needs less water. And then once you do that, then you can you can use that. We have five more minutes, and I want to ask the question I ask everyone uh, who we visit who comes to this class. So the Hudson Valley, how does this make what you do possible? We wouldn't be here. I mean, I wouldn't be here without the Hudson Valley. I can't imagine doing it anywhere else. I mean, maybe Western Massachusetts, which has a very similar um, relationship. But I mean, one is the physicalness of the valley itself. It's a valley, and it's lush, and um, people can grow here easily. And it has a history of farming, and it's close to all the major thoroughfares. It's really important to us. It's an educated consumer here, and the farmers are educated and are willing to work with us. You had asked the question, how um, do we work with farmers? And it's been a really, um, it's been a really long process. Um, we actually ended up working with just a few farmers in the end um, because we have a need for consistency. Unfortunately, it's it. it if you work with a lot of different farmers that have very small herds, um, it, just like you were saying, there's different, it might be the same variety, but just the way that they are produced, any changes, different grasses, different ways of feeding, um, produces variations in the meat, and consumers are not always that comfortable with that. We also did pasture raised rather than full 100% grass fed. There's a lot of terminology um, that's thrown around organic, grass-fed, pasture-raised. Um, and I think that, you know, we have tried to be clear with really with our consumers, and I think that consumers, as I said, are educated here. They know questions to ask, they're willing to learn. So that's been very important for us as well. Um, no, I like the Hudson Valley. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else at this point. John, you're from this area, so yeah. of course it's home. Right? It is home, but I, I agree on, on several points there. Uh, the diverse farming that goes on here in the valley. This is a very special place. It's really number two to California, you know, as far as I think resource for food and quality of life, and uh, to some parts of California. And that's very special about it. Um, the educated consumer base is is really uh, is super important, and also the ability for those consumers to be educated. I know I've done a lot of educating here. I stood every Wednesday night at Adams Derrick Farms for three years, putting pieces of bread in people's mouths and, 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 and answering the question like, why should I pay five dollars for this multi-grain bread when I can get it from Arnold's over there for three dollars and two dollars and eighty-nine cents? So um, they're able. People here are, are are educated and are able to be educated. And then the proximity to New York City as a market is was key for me because it kept me alive while I while I developed everything I developed through these three decades of standing there on the corner of Seventy and Broadway. Um, so that those are those are the, the points that I see in the Hudson Valley. Do you have class trip in the square? I uh, take the train. Yeah, just take the train. Take the train because you already train. I've already met a number of farmers. Yeah, there's well Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Um, Fridays are really good market. Well, they're all good markets. Friday, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.